So we often recommend folks look at the Google Fiber checklist or any of the Get Ready checklists that are out there. And if you would like to see that checklist, it's actually on the resource page of the Next Century Cities website. Um, and we highly recommend folks think about it because, as Jill said, um, you know, it's not so likely that Google's going to solve all our problems. And I, I do tell folks all the time there is no fairy broadband mother. And so we need to be prepared to, to move forward. And in, in following the checklist, you can have a lot of those get ready things done in advance. And it doesn't matter which provider ends up using it or whether you build yourself. It's helpful to have. It's my pleasure to bring up our next panel, moderated by Sharon Gillette, who is the principal network policy strategist at Microsoft and was previously chief of the Wireline Competition Bureau at the FCC. Our next panel. Well, welcome, everybody. While they're taking their seats, I will uh, explain that I am not planning to do big, long intros because you have their intros in the, their, their bios in the packet. But what I would like to do is go down the line, starting with Yasha, and uh, have each panelist take just a minute or two to explain what about their experience uh, bears on the topic of our panel, which is why broadband matters, what are the impacts uh, you know, uh, beyond infrastructure, let's call it that. Uh, so Yasha, if you'd start us off. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Yasha Franklin Hodge, uh, Chief Information Officer for the City of Boston. Um, so uh, I think for us, you know, my, my role in the city is, it covers sort of the traditional stuff of a, a governmental IT department, servers, software systems, all of that. But we also take a very active role in broadband and digital equity. And the reason for that is, you know, I think fairly straightforward. We heard it very eloquently from some of the speakers earlier today. But fundamentally, broadband is necessary for full participation in society in the 21st century. Uh, it's not a luxury. It's not a thing that uh, is what we get to after we've solved all of our other problems. It's a thing that is critical to economic mobility, to equity, to education. Uh, simply to, to access to government and participation in civil society. So for us, that's, that's the, the, the kind of, you know, guidestone starting point for thinking about how we address uh, broadband and digital equity. And, you know, it, it comes down to this, this simple idea that every resident and business in Boston should have access to affordable, high-speed Internet and the tools and skills to make use of it. Uh, and that's the goal that we're shooting for. We have a lot of work to do, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Great. Thanks, Yasha. Okay, thank Amy. you. Um, my name is Amy Tsung, and I work for NTIA as a broadband program specialist. I work specifically on the technical assistance program of Broadband USA that was mentioned before, and I just wanted to go into a little bit more detail what we do in our technical assistance program. We um, offer assistance to uh, communities, local governments, and stakeholders uh, across the country on um, different issues around broadband infrastructure and digital inclusion planning, community input processes, um, implementation, of course, and um, evaluation plans. Um, in addition to our in individual work with uh, local communities, um, we also help convene and connect communities that are facing similar issues. We, so, you know, events like these, conference calls, um, which some people have participated on here, um, webinars, we I'll make a plug for a webinar we're organizing on uh, October 15th on how cities use survey data um, to um, help their planning processes. Um, my personal focus has been on cities. I was a, a program officer with BTOP and worked with a lot of the major cities. I also have another hat. Um, I am an affiliate with the uh, Berkman Center for Internet and Society at uh, Harvard, and my research focus there is on inclusive innovation. And I'm really looking at how communities can not only adopt, but adapt and shape and create uh, technology in ways that empower them and further their own goals. And I've been able to look um, a little bit more broadly at international examples and examples across different fields like civic, civic tech, um, international development, microfinance. So, I'm Pamela Goldberg from the Massachusetts Technology Collaborative. We're an economic development organization focused on growing technology, innovation, 
across Massachusetts. Um, I was interested to hear how many cities and towns in Connecticut. There are 350 cities and towns in Massachusetts, and uh, most of those are are what would be considered largely served, but there are a number that are unserved communities or partially served. And so uh, we were part of the BTOP program. We put in 1,000 miles of fiber to connect schools, libraries, public safety facilities in 120 cities and towns, but uh, our work isn't done. And so we're looking at both last mile and adoption issues and, and what we can do to address the needs in the communities that are either underserved or unserved. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning. My name is Susan Corbett. I'm the CEO of Axiom Technologies. Axiom is a last mile broadband provider located in Washington County. Um, and we also are an information technology company helping small and medium businesses. We brought an educator on staff in 2006 because we realized as we were connecting people to the internet or businesses to the internet that they needed assistance in learning how to use it. Um, we are also a BTOP um, a recipient and we worked with our farming, fishing and nursing communities and really started to learn what were some of the barriers and some of the best practices to deliver um, digital literacy classes. About a year or so ago, we spun off a nonprofit side of the company called the Axiom Education and Training Center, moved all of our educational um, uh, pr services to the nonprofit, um, including adult education. Over the last few years, we have reached about 3,000 adult learners and over 300 businesses in teaching people how to use the computer um, and different programs on the computer. What we are trying to do is to decrease the barriers to education, and so we move the programs around the county. Um, we have been in 43 locations. Uh, we are in 17 of the 18 libraries in Washington County, and about 25% of the classes have taken place in those classes. So we look for partnerships and ways to decrease the barriers to education and to get the services out to the people. Um, my name is Tim Schneider. I'm the uh, main public advocate, which means I'm the head of the state agency that's charged with representing utility customers here in Maine. So that's water, electric, gas, a little bit of ferry service, um, and, uh, and telecommunication services. Um, I come to my personal interest in broadband because I care about the viability of rural communities, which is most of Maine, frankly. Communities that I grew up in and have lived in in Maine and in other states. Um, as a consumer advocate in, a reg in the regulated utility space, I come by this interest because over the past 35 years, in telecommunications, we've basically broken many of the business models and regulatory constructs that ensured universal service in those rural communities throughout the country and particularly in Maine. And ensuring that, and in doing so, we've undercut um, the potential for having broadband services that ensure the future viability of those communities. Um, where you never had to worry um, whether your auto body shop or your home in small towns in Maine would have telephone service. It's a very real thing right now that those communities would not have broadband service. Um, and as those regulatory constructs for telephone service break down, I view it as part of our, the work of our office to ensure that broadband service is there to pick up the slack. And we need to figure out what those new models are going to be like. And we're having an active conversation in Maine to try and figure out what that looks like. There's a pretty active conversation in Washington, D.C. about the same issue, so <laughs> that's great. Uh, so what we're going to do now, I'm going to do a, a, a sort of a lightning round, if you will, ask each panelist to address a particular issue and hope we might get a little bit of discussion among them, and after we're done with that round, we'll open it up to you all for questions. And um, so, Yash, I'll just go down the line to make it simple. So, Yash, I'll start with you. You, uh, you mentioned that it's important to you know, have broadband uh, available, usable, affordable, et cetera, to all of the citizens in Boston. And um, uh, can you speak about how you prioritize that? Because some of the gaps are not the same across different Yeah, absolutely. Different um, you know, it's, it's interesting to be uh, in, in the audience for, for this event where 
many of the issues are, uh, that are being discussed are focused on, on rural communities, which have, in some ways, a, a, a fundamentally different set of challenges and different set of economics than what we see in a city like Boston. In many ways, we're very fortunate. Uh, the vast majority of residences in the city of Boston, uh, close to 100%, have the ability to purchase broadband service from at least one provider. Uh, for 90% of those people, it is exactly one provider that they have the option to purchase broadband service from. Not ideal, but uh, certainly is an important step. Um, so as we tried to dig into this, you know, we found a pattern and really asked the question of, okay, where, where are the gaps and where can we, where should we be focusing our efforts? You know, we found some things that uh, were very similar to, to what uh, Ellen Katz in Connecticut talked about earlier. Um, you know, certainly we view competition and investment in broadband infrastructure broadly as fundamental to the long-term economic sustainability for the city. Uh, and having one option is not enough. Uh, so the starting point for all of this is to say we want to encourage competition and investment. But when we got into conversations with specific, uh, with, within the community and sort of really reaching out, what, what we found is that there were a few places where, two places in particular, where there was a, a more fundamental gap that we are, are trying to prioritize our efforts towards. Uh, the first is with smaller businesses, and particularly those businesses located outside of our central business districts. If you are a uh, you know, business in the Back Bay or downtown Boston, you have a multitude of options for traditional fiber providers uh, in, available typically in your building or uh, you know, a few hundred feet uh, out in the street. And, you know, there's an affordability issue, though, that sometimes comes along with that. Um, we've seen for many of our, our small businesses, once they grow to that point where they can't get away with the cable modem anymore, suddenly they're faced with this incredible sticker shock where they say, okay, well, if I want to go from a, you know, connection that tops out at a 20 megabit upstream on a good day to something that's, say, a 100 meg symmetric connection, my price tag went from... $250 a month to $2,500 a month. And if I want to go to a gigabit, I'm talking, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars a month. That's real money, and especially for a growing business, uh, that's, a, that's a, you know, often the, the question of, do I get the internet connectivity I, that I need, or do I hire another employee that I need? That's not a choice that we feel like businesses should have to face in the city. Um, in neighborhoods outside of the central business districts where often smaller companies are trying to move because of issues with real estate affordability, uh, it's even worse. There's often no other option besides that cable modem. Uh, or the option comes with a, a price tag that's measured in the tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars because the providers want to uh, have the full capital costs of, of bringing fiber from wherever it exists to that business's location. They need to have that paid for. So that's a huge gap for us uh, that uh, is impacting a lot of our small businesses and it's particularly acute when we're in this time of increasing real estate prices and a desire on the part of the city to see the benefits of our innovation economy spread broadly into to more neighborhoods and more communities. Um, the other uh, population that uh, I think is, is, is clearly uh, we need to put emphasis on, you heard uh, uh, others like David Edelman speak about some of the statistics behind this, is uh, our uh, low-income uh, uh, population, seniors, families, students. The homework gap is a real thing, and as we're making incredible strides towards improving the quality of technology in schools, that question of what happens at the end of the school day becomes increasingly pressing for us. So we're excited to be partners in the Connect Home Initiative. Um, we are uh, working to, uh, conti we're continuing to support uh, the uh, program called Technology Goes Home, uh, which is uh, an incredibly successful program for uh, closing the access gap. Uh, Deb Socha, with, now with Next Century Cities, uh, really built this program into what it was with the help of funding from BTOP. Um, but it is, uh, I think, a model for how to think about access at home that in a way that isn't just saying, okay, well, we, we just put the fiber in or we build the connectivity and everything's good, but actually saying, okay, you need to think about equipment, you need to think about skills training, you need to think about the role that parents play, that teachers play in helping students be successful utilizing broadband infrastructure. So we're continuing to support Tech Goes Home as a, a key piece of our equity strategy and recognizing that this really is fundamentally uh, you know, you, you, can, you can zoom in and say there's a homework gap, you can say, you know, there's a cost burden, but this is fundamentally about inequality and trying to make sure that we're doing what we can to make for a more equal city. Um, 
and then the other piece that we're we're doing when it comes to the um, to, to to that issue of of low income as well as broadly small businesses and economic development, we are expanding our city wireless network. Now I, I will put a big asterisk on this because the the history and promise of municipal Wi-Fi has been. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a checkered past, uh, and we're trying to be very realistic about what it can and can't do. Uh, Tim, one of my uh, uh, fellow panelists, uh, many years ago, almost a decade ago now, worked on a project in Boston that had this ambitious goal of covering the city with uh, a, 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 a public-private partnership citywide Wi-Fi network that would work in everyone's house. Well, still not there, still not working, and nobody has succeeded at that. But we do think that public Wi-Fi plays an important role as a backstop for uh, families that may struggle with the affordability of home broadband or may, who may have a mobile solution through a prepaid carrier that they may not be able to pay for every month. Uh, so is there a place that the kid can go with a Chromebook or a tablet and get online? There's the public library, but often, uh, you know, can we create places that are fine places that are closer to home, whether it's inside of public housing or in some other a community center in another city facility that can become that backstop where people don't have that home access. We also think about it as an amenity that helps our Main Street commercial districts. Uh, you get free Wi-Fi at the mall, why don't you get Wi-Fi in your Main Street? Uh, so we're looking at targeted deployments that focus on these areas where we think it can have an equity benefit and an economic development benefit, being very mindful that there are severe limitations to the technology, but it can be a piece of this larger puzzle. Well, thank you very much, Yasha. And um, uh, I think your discussion about public housing might be a really good, uh, good transition to our, our next, uh, the next question here. Before I, uh, before I ask Amy her question, I... Uh, I um, I have to play a little bit of a game of secret facts, uh, things you may not know about some of the people on the panel. So I, I find a little bit ironic that I'm about to ask Amy to talk about what do you have, is it build it and you will come, or are there other things you have to do to make broadband projects successful? What about the demand side, the adoption side, the education side, and so on? That's my question for her. But uh, the irony is that uh, some, some time ago, uh, before I was in government, I was a research academic at MIT, and my topic of research was mostly about broadband policy. And one of my brighter students, um, there are many bright students at MIT, but one of them was a, a young lady named Amy Tsung, who wrote her thesis, which I supervised, on uh, municipal fiber to the home in Grant County, Washington, if I recall correctly. <laughs> Uh, so I guess we've all discovered that building it is not enough. There needs to be more. So Amy, would you tell us more about that? Sure. Thank you. Um, and she was a great advisor. So, <laughs> um, so as um, as you know, um, BTOP actually made a huge investment, or at least you know, um, a very large investment in um, in in not only. Um, infrastructure, but also public access and outreach and training to increase uh, adoption and um, to build digital skills, especially in underserved and vulnerable populations um, that uh, Yasha referred to. And um, a couple lessons that we are actually um, integrating into our technical assistance is really um, the importance of in investing time and resources into that, um, what in my research I call social infrastructure, so that network of local leaders that um, and organizations and partnerships that really understand the local community and what their needs are and what their goals are and, and, and can tailor them, because that's really where you get the discussion beyond you know, the network or what device is best. It's really what are your goals? What is that? What is your vision for your community? And how does that fit into this? And again, the earlier panel um, <clears throat> referred to this, but this is a really important part. Um, also, um, the importance of training and outreach. Uh, <coughs> For example, in Chicago, the Smart Communities Program um, provided intensive training and outreach in uh, nine um, predominantly low-income uh, neighborhoods, uh, including neighborhoods with uh, a lot of public housing. And, um, and uh, they had this whole outreach program based on hiring local people as technology organizers. 
And um, Karen Mossberger from Arizona State University did a, um, a pretty comprehensive um, evaluation study over five years, three surveys over five years, and they found that in the communities where this intensive outreach and training occurred, internet adoption increased by 15% compared to 6% for the other Chicago neighborhoods. And that's controlled for demographics. So, and also what's interesting in that case is that they didn't offer a special subsidy in these, um, these neighborhoods for, um, for uh, um, computers or for access. Um, I mean, maybe the, uh, the numbers would have been higher, but um, you know, that 9% difference came from again, training and outreach. So that, again, shows the importance of, of these types of programs. Um, another uh, thing I, point I want to make is that the digital divide, per se, is becoming increasingly a skills gap. So really, um, uh, even when you have a higher level of adoption, you still have this skills gap and, and this gap in um, this inequality in people's um, ability to take advantage of all the benefits that broadband would bring, like you know, uh, remote education opportunities, like telehealth. Um, all these things need um, professional development amongst teachers <coughs> and medical professionals uh, to take advantage. Um, it also, um, we, can, we can see how the jobs are, are demanding higher and higher skills. So another example is a, a rural county in uh, Cook County, Oregon. Um, they uh, were predominantly um, had a lumber, uh, where their economic uh, economy was based on lo the lumber industry, but they actually had um, Facebook and Apple located their data centers there. But they knew that, of course, that would bring a lot of economic benefits, but they wanted to make sure that local people could benefit from this. So uh, they built on um, the community college a training center as well as a mobile lab and um, started with basic uh, digital literacy, but also to build the skills so that people, local people could actually take advantage, started offering uh, tech server technician certification. Again, you know, really trying to bring people to the level where they could uh, take advantage of the high-tech industry that was coming to their community. Yes, Pamela. So this is a nice pivot, the way that you have chosen to seat yourselves, because uh, Yasha and Amy primarily focus on the larger urban communities. Uh, uh, Susan and Tim are primarily focused on Maine and the more rural parts of Maine, I think. Well, you have the whole state, I guess. But, you know, the rural parts are a big, big issue. And Pamela works for an agency that works both, has both mass broadband, which is focused more on the western part, but also the whole state. Certainly mass tech worries about the whole state. As well as uh, the John Adams Innovation Institute that focuses on more on economic development and so forth. So I was hoping you could bring together those threads and talk to us about the economic impact of broadband. What are some examples you see of that? Thank you, Sharon. I think that it's a complex question with many answers. And I think that because the charge of Mass Tech Collaborative is economic development, because we're looking at technology innovation, that the fact that uh, we're looking at the startup community, we're looking at new innovations in technology in partnership with universities, we are, um, in addition to our Broadband Institute and our Innovation Institute that Sharon mentioned, we also have a Health Technology Institute. And so some of the threads that have been talked about today are with regard to telehealth. And so, in fact, one of uh, the communities that was completely unserved, um, the town of Leverett, who you'll be hearing from later, decided that they would build out their network themselves and, and just go ahead and do it once we had built out the middle mile. And in talking to them about, well, why did you do that? Why didn't you wait for the state to jump in and, and help you with it? And they said, well, and I said, is it really about economic development? Is it really about bringing more jobs to your community? And the response was, and as we heard earlier on a panel about the different motivations for different folks, and the motivation for Leverett was about telehealth. 
and, and the importance of telehealth to the people in the community currently. Uh, one of the things that we look at um, in response to that is, is twofold. One of those is, what do you mean by telehealth? Telehealth means different things to different people. If you ask the president of a hospital what telehealth means, they're going to be talking about uh, health care support between physicians or among physicians. And, uh, but I think for the community of Leverett, it was patient access to physicians and remote monitoring, which is a very different definition of telehealth. But I think that another advantage for a community like Leverett and many other communities is the opportunity for increased property values. Uh, we did, uh, we received a grant from NTIA a few years ago that gave us the opportunity to promote adoption. And so we worked with some community development corporations and to bring businesses to the table to help them access the internet and use internet in their businesses. And what we discovered is that more than half of the businesses that came to the table had never used the internet for anything regarding their businesses. They didn't have a website. They didn't, uh, weren't filing their taxes on the internet the way they need to. And so just that adoption piece of bringing people up the learning curve and helping businesses be part of the new millennium in terms of uh, being connected. Uh, we had a wonderful story of a small bakery in the Berkshires that had um, decided, well, now that there is internet access, I will build a website and put my business online and within two months, she had a $10,000 order from a Boston company for her baked goods. And that couldn't have happened if she hadn't had the web presence. So it's a, a, an array of different pieces of the equation that we're looking at. Ob obviously, as was said before, adoption is a critical piece. Um, you know, we've we focused a lot of our energy in the early days of just putting the pipes out there and trying to get folks connected. And and but it's applicable in urban areas. It's applicable in rural areas. Thanks, Pamela. And Susan, and you you and Tim have uh, can I hope speak to. Uh, I'd really like to focus in rural areas on what works. Okay, what are, what, are, what are models that work? And I think one model that works is Susan, <laughs> which we're very fortunate to have her on this panel. Um, so could you say more? I know you, you had a BTOP grant. I imagine that's finished now. And you mentioned you have a nonprofit. So perhaps you could talk to us more about sort of who the stakeholders are that help make a nonprofit successful in a rural community and uh, you know, how, you, how you make that sustainable. Okay, well, it's, it's not easy. No, it's not. <laughs> That's why I asked you the question. <laughs> so, so the, um, the B, BTOP was really what pushed us forward. Um, we had about um, 100 farmers, fishermen, their crews and their family participate in the program. And during the two-year time period, they reached about 13,000 learning hours, which was really some really high numbers. And one of the reasons that that worked is that we moved the classes throughout the county. So Washington County is 2,500 square miles. We moved, we, they were at different locations. And when we got to the time of the year when the farmers and fishermen were really gearing up into the late spring and summer and early fall, we held classes when it was raining really hard or really windy. So you, we really had to, you know, it, it, was, it was really all about them, not about us and what was convenient for them. Um, when we reached the end of the, the BTOP grant um, period, we, um, we, we got the attention of a, um, a private foundation who said, you know, we really like the work you're doing, we'd like you to apply for funding, and nobody ever does that, so we were really excited about it. And so we got, we're funded for two years to do classes throughout Washington County. Um, I, and again, you know, this was not for the convenience of the staff and for, um, uh, for us, it was what, how are we going to get the classes to the people? And so holding classes throughout the county at multiple locations, the libraries were a real big, a, a, a real um, big draw. Um, but then there were the community, both the, the um, 
a university man at Machias, Washington County Community College, the career centers, um, community buildings, um, and then um, uh, businesses. So that was the other really big push here. We had businesses and empl um, employers and employees that needed to have um, training. They needed to you know how to use their, the internet, how to use the software programs, how to even turn on a computer, and so classes were held at business location. So what we wanted to do was to ensure the success and move those and, and make it as accessible as possible to our, um, to our residents. Um, the, what we found is it really is a public-private partnership. There is, um, when we went into the adult ed world, there's some public funds that come in. We are doing, we're doing these programs throughout, um, throughout the state. Um, a real big thanks to the Unity Foundation and UNITEL for doing a project down there to proof of concept. If you increase, if you are able to provide digital literacy, will it increase take rate, which is a good thing because then that means there's more revenue for the providers to continue to build out network. Um, so it, it takes a lot of, it's a lot of moving parts, um, but we're, and we keep trying new, new things. I think the most important message, though, and um, from our Director of, of Educational Services, Jane Blackwood, is how we teach is more important than what we're teaching. So having classes in a very relaxed, non-threatening um, atmosphere is really what has ensured the success of the program. That's great. That's great. Thanks so much. And, uh, Tim, I, uh, I begin this again with a little bit of background, which is that when I was studying this topic of community or municipal broadband as an academic, um, you know, academics always have to define their terms, so I had to, to figure out what the difference was between community and municipal broadband. But if you say, as soon as you say municipal broadband, you're presuming the existence of a municipality, which is not always true in a rural area. As soon as you say community broadband, you're assuming a sort of density of community that may or may not be true in a rural area. So could you reflect to us on, on sort of the, the community slash municipal broadband models and how they play in, in very rural parts of your state? Yeah, uh, I mean, I think there's been a lot of energy nationally, but even in Maine, about using a municipal model or a community-based model. And, and in Maine, often those efforts have been led by people whose full-time job it is to care about the economic development of their community or to the city planner who just sort of gets it. Um, and I think a lot of the energy at that national level has focused on you've got staff and the ability to um, obtain capital through bonding mechanisms. There's a lot of energy right there. Um, and that has made municipalities a credible party to come to play in the broadband, broadband conversation. Um, I like the community-based model for a slightly different reason. And the communities that we work at in Maine um, don't often have the robust internal infrastructure. They don't have someone whose full-time job is to go out and um, do the work on economic development, whose job, or a full-time city planner. This is true of rural communities throughout the state. Um, but I think there's a lot of potential for that model because when you start having the conversation at the community level, you really get that commitment to universal service. Like we already have a broadband model that works for our downtown cores. It's called a cable company. They do that really well in, in a lot of very rural communities throughout Maine where you have dense service in the inside of the donut, but you don't have universal service in that community because the business model doesn't play beyond that, that relatively dense urban core, which isn't even that dense by most people's standards. Um, I think that uh, individual communities, when they are choosing to invest their time and energy to solve the broadband problems, will make sure that they go beyond that downtown, we'll make sure they reach those the next level out. And you see this in some of the models for small telephone companies in Maine. Places where you're not, they are, <laughs> you have a choice between one super rural community or another super rural community. It's not, you know, do I provide service in the, the largest city in the state or a rural community where you're not competing for investment dollars. So you're starting to see those companies, um, they, have, they have a limited footprint in which to invest their funds and they go bring it there. I think there's a similar potential for rural communities in Maine. But frankly, there is not that kind of infrastructure you have. You know, there's no small town in Maine that has a CIO <laughs> who's going to look out and care about these issues on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, Yasha, he has a job for you. <laughs> we can't pay you. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the working theory, it's, it's great to see so many members of the Utilities Committee in Maine here today. Uh, give them all shout outs, but one of the work, the work that Representative Higgins did and that committee did last session was working on a model of, uh, to pass some legislation around a model for how to do this in rural communities in Maine. And it looks, it doesn't rely on um, 
an existing city infrastructure, it revolves around creating local champions, providing a framework for what it looks like to get your community ready for broadband, to then provide state matching funds through the Connect Main Authority to help them do the kind of broadband planning that Brianna, one of from the Island Institute, described earlier, where what do you have in your community now, what do you want, what do you want to achieve, and how do we get there? Do that from the ground up, a conversation that by its nature needs to involve incumbents because many of them are the people who are there in the community now, and for them it's just a slight incremental spend. How do we make that those numbers work? Um, I think we laid a good foundation there, but the premise of that is that if you provide support, we provide some matching funds, and you provide a process to develop local champions, that you can bring even communities that don't have full-time full -time staff along. I don't know if that's true. Frankly, that's an experiment we're embarked on here in Maine over the next two years, I think. Um, it might work for, there might be communities for whom that works. Uh, I think there will likely be communities for whom that doesn't work. And I think if you're committed to universal service, you need a solution that works in the places where local champions rise up, and you need a place where they, they, that capacity doesn't exist. And I think probably the solution is going to involve some regional collaboration, figuring out through this process models that work and then replicating them in the places where it didn't work the first time. Thank you. And um, I can tell that Tim works on universal service because he talked about donuts. And uh, I spent two, three years at the FCC working on universal service, and we talked a lot about donuts. There were a lot of pictures of them on my whiteboard. Uh, but if you're not familiar with what he meant by that, uh, you know, what he's referring to is if you look at a map, you know, if you look at rural areas, there will often be a... Uh, the main street, you know, the town where the where the uh, the local stores are, and then there's the surrounding, usually farms or uh, you know rural um, uh, settlement, and and so the, the the inside is the hole inside of the donut, and then the donut is where all the the very dispersed and uh, low uh, low square mileage density um, uh, people are. Um, I also just wanted to say, when we're, as long as we're talking about universal service policy in this uh, in this context, I, I'm very encouraged um, that um, with uh, with the um, changes at the FCC in terms of how broadband is treated, that uh, there is currently pending at the FCC a proceeding to direct uh, adoption funds towards broadband, which is to say uh, the Lifeline program, which has historically been all about subsidizing telephone service for low-income consumers, uh, there was a proposal to extend that to, uh, to broadband service. And uh, um, uh, my company has filed comments supportive of that, and among the examples that we use to explain why we think that's a good thing is that uh, we've been involved in a, in a, a project working with uh, Health Choice Network, TrackPhone, and Mo Mo um, Moby Medics in a mobile health pilot program, which basically involves uh, getting a, a health, it, you spoke, Pamela, about telehealth, about getting a, a health app on um, essentially subsidized broadband service on a phone uh, to a consumer, and it reminds them of their appointments, it helps them control their diabetes, their blood sugar, um, and in fact, we found with this program that it reduces missed appointments, and that saves money for all the community health providers, which is essentially Medicaid government funding, government is federal and state funding. So, um, you know, there are uh, so many synergies. You, Pamela spoke about economic development. There's also one thing I found in my time in government. People don't realize how much money broadband saves <laughs> because uh, there's so many efficiencies that come from using it. And I think that's also important when people are, uh, Jill, you spoke about making the case for your community. Some of that is cost savings, which is really, really important nowadays. Did anyone want to respond to that? I'll talk to okay, and then, then we're going to, if people want, the mics are there and there, and we'll, uh, after Pamela speaks, we'll open to questions, so please just line up at the mic. Okay. So uh, I think that the cost savings is an important piece. It may not be the core to economic development, but as we look at the healthcare challenges across the nation, um, it's amazing that broadband can, in fact, in, impact uh, bringing down the cost of health care. And uh, one of the sites that we connected with our BTOP project was Berkshire Medical Center, which is um, basically the only health care facility um, in, in the Berkshire Mountains. And their costs after 
They uh, got the connection. They were able to install an electronic health record system. They were able to create a telehealth system and their expenses went down by $37,000 a month. And so that's a pretty dramatic uh, drop in expenses which should flow through to their patients and that's a really powerful change uh, and that's just one example of that. Okay, Yasha wants to respond as well. Um, I think this just kind of highlights a really interesting point. I mean, one of the challenges we see at the city when we think about uh, broadband and fiber within the city is, is cost, right, and this question of how do you pay for it all. And, you know, I'll be frank, there's not, we're not living in an environment where there is uh, massive public uh, uh, appetite for, you know, spending hundreds of millions or billions of dollars building out broadband networks in, in major urban areas. Uh, these taxpayer dollars, but when you start to think about the savings that can be had through telehealth, you start to think about the institutional savings that municipalities can see by uh, uh, consolidating some of their connectivity needs. Um, you know, you start to think about, uh, for example, this question of, you know, we're building out our institutional network within the city. There's kind of a clear economic logic for us to connect all of our schools, all of our buildings, and for us to have a fiber network, but we're asking the question, can we do that in a way that brings fiber closer to some of the businesses that we're trying to serve? And so that when they do go out to a private provider and say, okay, I need uh, a connection at my uh, store in a, in a neighborhood business district, that instead of the $60,000 to run the fiber down the street and uh, around the block and, uh, and under the street, it's okay, well, if we can just get to that manhole across the, the way, we've got something there that we can utilize. So I think that notion, and, and it's really reflected in the, uh, the, the Broadband uh, Opportunities Council report of how do, we, how do we identify all the places where we're spending money today uh, and, and put some of that to use for broadband and really see that as a, a syner synergistic savings and investment. And, and, and uh, just to build on that as well, um, uh, Jill talked about dig once. Uh, one of the other things I found in government was so... So many things you do have a payoff that's 10 years down the line, but planning today for the future is going to make it, you know, broadband's going to be with us for a long time, and it's going to keep getting faster. We think a gigabit today, it'll be 10 gigabits before we know it, right? So uh, we, we need to be putting in place today the duct work, the access, all the physical infrastructure, the training, the libraries, all the community infrastructure in terms of uh, uh, social capital, if you will, um, that helps this whole... Uh, it, both uh, improvements in the infrastructure and improvements in the use and improvements in the equity, the uh, uh, use across all of our communities, uh, to go forward. And, and uh, Dig Once is one example. Um, you know, uh, thinking about um, libraries as kinds of hubs for the community or, or other uh, types of um, uh, institutions like Susan was talking about. I think those are all very important to the, uh, to the sustainability of this. And one thing I would just, uh, this is well before your time, so I'm not criticizing, <laughs> but just from a conversation you and I had, uh, you know, Boston and federal government spent a lot of money on the big dig, which began before we were all having these conversations about broadband, or before most of us were, when back in that day, these rooms were a lot smaller, let's put it that way. So now we all get it, we get how important it is, but the big dig is all concrete now, <laughs> okay? So now when we're doing big projects like that, or even small projects like that, we should be looking forward to how are we gonna make, the, make it possible to keep this, get this infrastructure in place, keep it upgraded, and keep the community involved. I, I, it's absolutely right, and I would just add to that, we think about Dig Once. So Boston, it turns out, is I, I believe the first city in the country to implement the Dig Once policy uh, in the late 1980s, but it was done with the express intent of keeping people from digging up the pavement too often. Nobody was thinking about broadband as a primary driver for that. So what I discovered last year when I joined the city is that we have an unknown number of miles, but many miles, of conduit that belongs to us underneath the streets of Boston. The location of that conduit is on paper maps in the basement of City Hall. And if by some miracle you figure out where that conduit is and you come to us and look to uh, rent that conduit, we have a rental model that often makes it economically, that incentivizes you to dig up the streets again and put in your own conduit rather than rent it from the city. <laughs> Uh, and so th there's, there's 
these kinds of things, there's so many opportunities to bring these resources together, but really thinking about, okay, how do we do this in a way that actually makes it work for broadband and for the moment that we're in today and that we'll be in over the next five to ten years? There's a lot of work to do. It is, and, and it's amazing how picayune some of these details can be, but how important they are. Art, you've been waiting very patiently. Thanks. Yes, thank you. And please uh, introduce yourself. I'm, I'm Arthur Ware, and I'm uh, an advocate for uh, all things broadband and certainly high-speed networks uh, and the implementation of them and advocating for education of our public officials and getting them up to speed with uh, moving and doing something uh, and moving whatever toward whatever pathways they want to move. But the question I have, um, in my organization uh, in 1999, we uh, decided that uh, we were going to move in a direction this time, at, during that time, sustainability was, and the green, whole green movement was just getting started. And what, I, what I've seen happen with that movement, and as I talk to uh, CIOs across our state in New York, uh, from Buffalo to New York City, um, they're all at different places. And I, don't, I know that Deb Socio was the person that started the broadband office or was the broadband office chair here in, or chief here in, in Boston or in Boston uh, next door. So, so I guess the point that I want to make um, with regard to sustainability now, every organization that has any kind of uh, public purpose or corporate uh, responsibility has a uh, broadband director or broadband office and people there to um, fill um, um, questions to apply for grants and so on. And I, I see that as being a, a key area with regard to um, the policy behind broadband. And I just like to throw that out as a question. Um, you, you really need some place to go and you need somebody to do it. And the CIO can't always be the person that's doing it because they're putting out fires and dealing with, you know, viruses and worms and different things. So it really needs to be somebody's job to do it. And in our state, we only have two cities that I know of that have broadband office directors. And one is Syracuse, the other one's in New York City. So go figure. Okay, so I think I'll translate that question as uh, does a, a sort of office of broadband or broadband office make sense and at, if so at what level of government and I'll just share, I know Ellen spoke about that, at, at how important that's been in Connecticut. Um, in Massachusetts, one of the reasons we were able to create the Mass Broadband Institute actually is because we had uh, actually, uh, Mass Broadband came in through, uh, through Governor Patrick but it was actually the previous governor, Governor Romney who created this position, uh, I think it was actually motivated by some Western Mass legislators uh, of uh, what was, I, I forget the official title, but the unofficial title was the Broadband Czar. Uh, the, the first occupant in that position um, had a good sense of humor and used to say, I don't know that I want to be called a czar because it didn't end so well for the Romanovs. <laughs> But let, the panelists, uh, would any of you like to reflect on sort of the, the broadband coordinator role? Um, How it should be filled, you know, is it feasible? I, I can speak to that a little bit in Maine. Um, first, I think the sustainability connection is an interesting one, particularly for a state like Maine, where um, the, pri the state's primary carbon impact comes from transportation and home heating. And broadband is a, is a solution to a transportation problem, right? So in a very real sense, one of the things that Maine can do to address its climate the, the climate change challenges is promote broadband infrastructure for, the, for a very rural state like this. Um, I, Maine has good bones in this respect um, for, oh, I'm going to blank on the year it was founded, but for at least the last 10 years we've had uh, the Connect Me Authority, which is this independent broadband office whose job it is is to look out ahead and try and make plans for what the state's broadband needs are to bring those stakeholders together. Their primary work has been through infrastructure funding grants, but they are right now in the process, engaging a process, a strategic planning process, to look at the state's broadband challenges, trying to figure out how the limited funding we have available and the work of state agencies can be brought together to promote to promote broadband deployment um, in the places in Maine where we have challenges, which is pretty much everywhere. Um, I think that's a really it has good bones in that regard. One of the other pieces that I think is interesting is there are 
many businesses in Maine located in very rural places, Jackson Labs comes to mind, Woodland Pulp and Paper Mills, another, where they rely on broadband to do their businesses, but then their workers go home. We have like the industrial equivalent of the homework gap, where we want these workers to be able to monitor processes remotely, to be able to do things from where they live, and they're not able to because they don't have high-speed access once they step off the mill, once they step out of the lab. That's not a reality for them. So I think uh, it's interesting to watch those large businesses start to think about how broadband um, outside of their footprint is important for their business's success. I'll just say we, we on Friday posted a job for a uh, broadband and digital equity advocate in the city of Boston and it's specifically recognizing the need to have this be somebody's job. Uh, thinking about convening across the different parts of the city that play a role in broadband uh, so that when we do talk to people thinking about making infrastructure investments that we can speak with one voice, thinking about how we engage with the community to really understand the needs and the challenges, uh, and then thinking about how we can focus our efforts, whether they be around regulatory reform or infrastructure investments that the city's making to uh, get to the broadband future we want to see. So we think that's a job. We, we, we have it posted now and uh, we hope to, uh, to, to, to uh, have that office in place in the coming months. Good morning. Uh, my name is Teresa Kelly. I'm a retired IT person. A couple of years ago, my last employer was IBM. And I can't tell you how delightful it is to be on the outside now um, <laughs> and to be watching how, what a mess it is to, uh, to consumers around how do they get this going. Um, one thing that uh, I'm working on right now is the, farms, the, the food system of Maine and working specifically with the Farm Bureau of Maine. And um, the farming system has a good long tradition of cooperatives, meaning that they don't have full-time people, but they get themselves together to get projects done and over with so they then go back to farming or others. Uh, and as a matter of fact, right now, uh, there is a new cooperative, the Maine Farm and Sea Cooperative, that is being brought together. And technology will be a huge issue for them. But I haven't heard anyone up here yet talk about the cooperative model as being a potential for the way that Maine could move forward. And I have to tell you that every time that um, those in the Farm Bureau and others hear the use of the word community broadband and municipal broadband feel left out by that language because they hear that as being cent you know, city-centric um, and not really dealing with the externals. When the truth is that our farms are some of our biggest um, economic drivers for the state, they represent multi-million dollar businesses, and yet they are on the end of roads that can't get access. So I'm looking at Susan and Tim in particular, um, but we'd love to hear who else has the, some experience perhaps in cooperative broadband development. So I think Chibik.net is an excellent example of cooperative broadband. Um, um, when David and Beverly put their project together to bring, to move from a, a wireless 900 system that maybe got a one meg, um, one meg down, and they moved to a DSL model, it took five providers to make that happen. And you know what? It worked. Um, everybody worked really well together. Um, it took a little, you know, a little finessing to do it, but you know what? It was done. And I think that, you know, we're seeing more of that. You know, many providers work together. Um, Axiom works with most of the providers around the state of Maine. So, uh, you know, the model, the model is there. We just need to do more of it. Um, it's not going to, there's no one provider or one solution that's going to, um, that's going to fix this. So we absolutely have to all work together. The only thing I would add to that is that there are uh, a number of what used to be called telephone co-ops and, um, and the NTCA, not to be confused with the NCTA, which is the National Cable Association, and TCA is the National Telephone Cooperative Association. At least that's what it used to stand for. They may have changed what the letters stand for, but uh, there's three or four hundred of them nationwide that receive quite a bit of funding actually from the Universal Service Fund, the, the portion that funds deployments. Uh, I, but I don't happen to know whether there's, it, would, you would know, are there some in Maine? Uh, there are some. Um, they, don't, they don't cover all the rural areas in Maine. No, they right? don't. Um, you know, cooperatives are how, how rural electrification happened. The, the Rural Electrification Administration was about providing technical assistance and low interest loans to 
farmer cooperatives. And that model of um, sort of a grassroots basis of people coming together, this is the problem, stringing telephone service or electricity along, along barbed wire fences, you know, this, is, uh, this has worked in the past and cooperatives, you know, the cooperatives in New York ended up running oil refineries in Mohawk Airlines, so they can do great things come, when they come together. I think um, one of the weaknesses of that model in Maine is that in the heyday of cooperatives, there were a lot more farmers. Um, and it was really every member of the community who was a farmer, and that is true in some communities in Maine now, but many rural communities in Maine have much, many fewer farmers than they did a long time ago. And figuring out where the infrastructure for cooperatives comes from in the future is, I think, an open question. Where will they step up, and then can we provide them the support they need, much like electrification? Okay, so we have two people at the mic, so I'm going to make those last two questions, and then we'll have about 30 seconds for each of you to say anything that you haven't had a chance to say yet, okay? So, please, this side of the room. There's a light right behind you, so I can't even see you, but <laughs> Hi, <my laughs> please introduce is, yourself. My, my name is Johan Sabbath, and I work at WEX, Inc. We're based just in South Portland, about 2,000 employees spread around the world, and uh, most of them are here in Portland and it's really in my company's interest to have a rich knowledge worker ecosystem in the greater Portland area, broadband, very important to that ecosystem. I'm just wondering through your experience as well, two quick questions. One, what's the smallest, I'd, I'd love to know what the smallest city that you're aware of, city, is who actually has a CIO who does the kind of work that you do. And in general, um, you know, what's the role of the Unum, Wexes, Idexes, LL Beams, like the really big companies in Portland who need this rich ecosystem and need this kind of broadband to be here in the greater Portland area. What are some examples of kind of private sector, big company collaborations you've seen to support small cities and towns? And what do you think Wex could do with some other companies to aid that in Portland and Maine? Thank you. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that first question. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of fortunate enough in Boston that my office is able to encompass some of this broadband work. Um, but you know, as, as I said, we're hiring somebody because this, we do have a lot of things like viruses and uh, other day-to-day -day operational things that we uh, that we deal with as well. Um, I, I'm wondering if uh, Emmy or if somebody else in the panel might have a sense of, of where they've seen. Uh, this kind of investment in broadband in, in smaller communities, how that gets championed within local government, because it's, a, it's not something I actually have much uh, exposure to. Yeah, so um, later you'll hear from my colleague, Eric Nakajima, of our broadband, the Massachusetts Broadband Institute, and he has been going out community to community, um, and this is uh, less about the cities than more rural areas, but Every town has a board of selectmen, and it's really remarkable as people learn about the potential for broadband impacts, um, how they become the internal champions. So there may not be a broadband czar in some of these towns, but we have discovered that whether it's a city or a town, they're often champions within that community. And we're fortunate in Massachusetts that our Senate president happens to be one of the biggest champions of broadband access and bringing broadband to all. And so he gets that. Uh, for Portland, I'm not sure. Um, so how, <laughs> we're having a statewide conversation about broadband and how to how to get involved, step up, right? Like the big employers need to come to play. We've had, you know, we had a, a hearing about broadband legislation in Maine and the farmers sent 20 people and there was no one from Unum. There was no one from WEX. You know, these big employers who have an interest in making sure there's a rich knowledge worker economy that can live in this place that everybody wants to live. And that's not happening. So um, I think there's a really great potential role for private um, private employers to step in, particularly because the assumption has always been that it's going to be a government spend to get this work done. It's going to be big federal dollars like another stimulus, or there's going to be a big state bonding that will bring broadband everywhere. That number is just too big. 
So it's going to need, we're going to need money from everywhere, right? We're going to need some, a little bit of state money. We're going to need some federal money. We're going to need private, private employers to help step up, nonprofit foundations, and we'll cobble things together to solve this very difficult problem to make the business model work. But you got to come to play. Hi, I'm Saul Tenenbaum. I'm a member of, but not speaking for, required disclaimer, um, the City of Cambridge um, um, Broadband Task Force. Um, we are the People's Republic of Cambridge, and there are people in Cambridge who are interested in co-ops too. So it's not just a rural thing, um, though at, at this point it's a small minority, um, very small minority. Um, but that's not really my question. I, I, one to sort of pull on the threads of digital equity and the digital divide, because Cambridge has become, um, you know, remarkably wealthy over the last decade, but we still have a digital divide and we have a high cost of living. So, I mean, beyond the usual, you know, focus on housing policy, you know, public housing, and one of my colleagues on the task force is from a housing authority. You know, we have people who struggle to pay for broadband. Um, are there, I mean, what mechanisms would any of you suggest to make sure that we can actually provide broadband to everybody um, regardless of the ability to pay? I did mention the. I, I do think that you know the the, uh, the lifeline program should the proposal go through will be very helpful to that. I, I also think the income. It's very important to separate the income from the geographic or the the you know access from ability to pay. Their access and affordability are separable issues. I I couldn't quite tell which one you were asking about. We have both. I mean, yeah. In, um, you know, the, the access, I mean, it, at some level, it is easier to deal with. Um, I mean, it's capital investment in making sure fiber runs to public housing, et cetera. Um, I, I but just say it's there, affordability it, is really... The, right, so affordability, I think that the lifeline reforms, should they go through, will be very helpful with that. And, uh, and, and it, it, but, but, you know, affordability is not the only issue. It's also all the training and comfort and relevance and so forth that people like Susan and what Deb has done in her past life and so forth are really working on. It's really, really important. Um, we are uh, at time. So if you have a five second response, do it. <laughs> and then we'll wrap, okay? <laughs> Just to mention that um, Cambridge Housing was a BTOP grantee and they've done an extraordinary uh, job in training and basically creating some of the demand um, and, and really integrating uh, broadband into their uh, educational and social um, programs. So. Okay, great. Please join me in thanking this remarkable panel.